please turn in your Bibles today to the book of Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and today I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. We're going to hit a lot more passages than Luke 8, but I didn't want you to have to turn to all of them, so you may just have to listen to me some. Today we're continuing a series that we started last week called Story Time. In this series, we're looking at several of the parables that Jesus told in the book of Luke during his ministry. Last week, we began by looking at a parable that is often called the parable of the sower, but I argued that it should probably be called the parable of the soil because the soil is what changes in the story, not the sower. But let's go ahead and read that in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. It says, while a large crowd was gathering and were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and then when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears, let them hear. Luke tells us that after Jesus told this parable, the disciples asked him what it meant. And in verses 11 through 15, Jesus talks about what the parable means. He starts off in verse 11 by telling them that the meaning of the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. We talked last week about how this one statement, the seed is the word of God, tells us not only that the seed is the word of God, but it tells us two other things. The first thing is that the sower is anyone who shares the word of God, anyone who spreads the gospel. In this story, that could be Jesus. Jesus could be the sower, the farmer. Later, it would be the disciples. And in fact, you and I, when we spread the word, we are the sower in this story. And the last thing that we can tell from this is that the soil in the story is anyone who hears the word of God. The soil is those people who hear the gospel. Now, Jesus goes on to tell his disciples that there are four types of people as it pertains to hearing the word. And he relates each of these four types of people to a different type of soil. And last week, I preached part one of this message, and we talked about the first two types of soil or people. Jesus explained these in verses 12 and 13 of Luke 8. Verse 12 says this, those along the path, in other words, the seed that was scattered along the path and the, and the path was hardened and the birds came and stole the seed, those along the path are the ones who hear and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The first type of person that we talked about last week were path people. I'm not going to go in depth on these first two today. I'm just going to kind of catch you up in case you weren't here. You can go to our YouTube channel, Centerpoint NWA, and you can watch the whole message from last week if you want to. But the first type of person is a path person. This is someone whose heart and mind is hardened to the gospel. It is hardened or closed off to the word of God. Usually this is because of something that has happened in that person's background in their past. We talked about how as sowers of the seed, sowers of the word, we don't need to simply just throw seed at them. We don't need to just throw seed down on hardened soil because it will never take root and the devil will keep it from growing. Instead, we talked about how we need to till the soil. We need to break it up and look for an opportunity to sow down deep. Jesus goes on in verse 13 to talk about the second type of person. He says, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The second type of person we talked about last week that Jesus talks about are rocky people. These are people who receive the word with joy, Jesus says, when they hear it. They're glad to hear it, and they receive the word, and they're excited, but that word doesn't take root, and so when the sun comes out, it withers. He goes on to say that when testing comes, these people will fall away. We talked last week about how rocky people are the church's biggest failure. These are people essentially who we introduce to Jesus, but then we never disciple them. 
We introduce them to the Lord, and then we never give them the tools that they need to grow. Now, this week we're going to talk about the last two types of soil, but I want to tell you first that last week when we talked about this, we talked about it mainly from the perspective of the sower, of the person sowing seed. We talked about how we need to sow seed when we're dealing with someone whose heart is hardened, how we need to sow seed when we, and disciple people when they get saved. But today we're going to flip things around. Today we're going to look at things from the perspective of the soil rather than the sower. And the reason why we're doing that is because I honestly believe that most people who are here today fall into one of these last two categories of people that Jesus talked about. We are one of the last two types of soil that he refers to. And today what I want to encourage you to do is I want to encourage you to evaluate your life, evaluate your relationship with the Lord, and evaluate what type of soil your heart is and what that means for your life, what decisions you may need to make. The third type of soil that Jesus talks about is found in verse 14 of Luke chapter 8. Jesus says, The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. The third type of person that Jesus talks about is a person who's surrounded by thorns. Seed that is sown among thorns. These are people, he says, who hear the word and they accept it. The word begins to grow in their life. There's just one problem. It's not the only thing that's growing. These are people who allow things other than the word to take seed, take root in their hearts, and to begin growing. The other things that Jesus talks about are thorns. Does anyone here have a flower bed in front of your house? Anyone? I'll tell you what, they're not here today, but I've been to the Perry's house, and they have a beautiful flower bed in front of their house. I mean, it is. if you're not careful, it'll make you jealous. You, you'll break one of the Ten Commandments, and you'll covet what your neighbor has because it is so, so pretty. Seth's father was a landscaper, a professional landscaper. He owned a business doing that. And it's very obvious that he has passed both the knowledge and the skills on to Seth. And Seth does a phenomenal job with his flower bed. Me, on the other hand, if Lori were here, she's my neighbor, she'd tell you I don't have anything close to a flower bed. I mean, I don't expend the time or energy that would be required to keep such a thing looking good. And even if I did, it probably wouldn't work. Me, I'll be honest, I'm lucky to keep my hedges trimmed. Is there anyone else that's like me? You're like, I go out there once or twice a year, I trim the hedges, and that's about all I can do. The thing is, if I ever did decide to plant a flower bed in in the area in my house where there's, I even have a little concrete thing that goes around it, the guy that owned the house before us put it in. But if I ever chose to plant a flower bed there, it would be a lot of work for me. And there's a reason why. There was a time in my life when we had a guy that we hired to mow our lawn. I was a youth pastor at the time, and and for those who don't know, youth ministers are very, very busy in the summertime. I mean, between fireworks sales and youth camp and missions trips, it was difficult to do anything at home, let alone keep my yard mowed. So we had a guy that we hired to mow our lawn, and he did a phenomenal job. I mean, I mean, his name is Raphael, and he's, he lives in our neighborhood, and he, is, he just does an awesome, awesome job with the exception of one thing. Raphael would point the ejection port of his mower towards my flower bed when he mowed the edge of the yard. He would shoot grass clippings into the flower bed because I used to have a flower bed that we just kind of inherited with the house. But he would shoot grass over there, and before I knew it, I had the most beautiful, lush, green grass growing in my flower bed. So if I were going to go in there now and try to, try to plant flowers and make it look nice, the flowers would grow. I could really easily go in there and sow some seed and, and water it, and they would grow. But the problem is that they would grow right alongside the grass. It would all grow up together. That is essentially what Jesus is talking about here. But instead of grass, Jesus says that these seeds were sown among thorns. 
I think the reason that he used thorns instead of weeds or grass was because thorns are dangerous. And the things that we allow to grow in our hearts alongside the Word of God, they can be dangerous to us. This third type of person is the type of person that accepts the Word and lets it grow in their life, but it's not the only thing that's growing in them. It's not the only thing that they allow in their hearts. These are people who allow things of this world to take root inside them and to grow. They love the Lord, but in in addition to letting his word grow in them, they let things like lust and greed and pride grow in their hearts. And here's the sad thing, church. I'm the type of person that observes people. And in all of my observation over the years, I think that this is probably the most prominent type of soil in the church. People who let other things, damaging things, deadly things, grow inside them. James talks about these people in James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves then to God, and he... Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then he goes on to say, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Get rid of the stuff that's taken root inside of you that shouldn't be there. You see, too many of us try to add Jesus to our garden. We've we've got a garden. We've got things that are growing there, some things that are not healthy for us. And we say, well, sure, I'll take some Jesus. We'll add Jesus to the garden. And we don't allow the gardener to come in and clean out the stuff that shouldn't be there. There was a song that was popular when I was a kid. People would, you remember back when we had special singings in church? You know what I mean? Someone would get up and, and, and sing like during the offering or whatever. It was, a lot of times it was an awesome thing. Other times it was kind of awkward. This one lady got up in a church service I was at one time and she said, just worship me while I sing these words. And that's not what she meant to say, but it was kind of awkward. There was a song, I don't know why I told that story. There was a song when I was a kid that was, that was popular in churches and it was about a person who invited Jesus to come and live in their hearts. And this song talked about how they took Jesus from room to room inside their hearts, showing him his new place that he had to live. They, they took him to the dining room, and they took him to the kitchen, and they, and they took him to the study, and they even took him to the bedroom. Anybody remember this song? In this song, there was this point where they got to a door at the end of a hallway in their heart, and the door was locked. And Jesus said, let me in. What, you know, what's behind this door? And the person singing the song who, who was telling this narrative said, oh, no, Lord, I'm not ready to let you in there yet. That, that's, that's my place, and, and you can't go in there. You can't clean that out. Guys, it would be ludicrous for us to think that we were going to go buy a house and we were allowed to have access to the whole house except for one closet, Right? I actually, we have a friend, Christina and I have a friend who's a real estate agent, and she was telling us a story. These people, they bought a house from her, and and they they were living in this house, and then they looked one day, and and underneath one of the walls, they they saw light coming out from an area where there was no room on the other side of the wall, and they were like, what in the world is this? And they went, they, they finally had someone come in and tear it up. And there was a hidden staircase into a hidden basement in the house that they had just bought. They didn't even know. Nobody knew. I think so many of us, we invite Jesus to come live in our hearts, but we've got a hidden basement that we don't tell him about. We try to hide from him. We say, no, 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 that's, that's my part. Jesus can have anything he wants in my life except for control over my finances. Jesus can have anything he wants in my life except for my decisions as it pertains to my relationships. He can have whatever he wants except for my reliance on drugs or alcohol or food or sugar or caffeine or whatever that thing is that is your crutch. 
you know that God addresses this way, way, way back in the book of Deuteronomy? There's a scripture, and Jesus actually refers to this scripture himself several times. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and here's what the Lord says. This is God speaking, and he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. I want to point you to a word that is in this passage. It's the seventh word. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with, what's the next word? All. I know sometimes I like to share with you the the truth about the Greek or the Hebrew, the background of a word, and I'm going to do that today. I'm I'm going to share with you some truth about this word, you can impress your friends with it later. You can can be out at lunch or whatever and say, well, I was reading in Deuteronomy the other day, and I I noticed that you, you can impress your friends. It'll be real neat. The word that is translated here as all is the word kol. K-O-L is how we would spell it in English, but it's pronounced kol. This word is used over 4,000 times in the Old Testament. It's used a lot, and I'm going to tell you what it means. Are you ready? If you got your pen out, get ready. I'm going to tell you. You want to know what it means? It means all. All. Like everything. The entirety of a group. When the Lord says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, he means with every single part of your heart. But see, here's the truth of that. If you're loving the Lord with all your heart, then there's no room for anything else to grow there. Because it all belongs to him. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Don't let other things grow in your life. Jesus said that the seed that falls amongst the thorns grows up, and the thorns grow up with it, and it says that it is choked out by the thorns. In explaining this to his disciples, he says that these are people who are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Church, I have to ask you today, are you being choked out by life's worries? Are life's worries getting to you? I know I've shared this passage with you probably a hundred times, and I'll probably share it a hundred more times in the next three years. But Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says this, do not be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything, Paul says. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, don't worry about anything, give it all to God. He says, when you do this, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything, but turn it over to God. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Jesus said that. Don't worry about your life, he said. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Don't worry about your body or what you're going to wear. Is not life more than food, he says. Is not the body more than clothes? Jesus goes on to say, look at the birds in the air. He says, they don't sow, they don't harvest, they don't store up things in barns, but the heavenly Father provides for their needs. How much more valuable are you than they? He says, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Look at the flowers in the field. He said, I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was more well-dressed than flowers. He said, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field that, that is here today and tomorrow they're going to throw it in the furnace, then how much more does he care about you? He says, so don't worry. Verse 31, don't worry saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Don't worry saying, how are we going to pay the mortgage? Don't worry saying, how am I going to get a job? Don't worry saying, well, how am I ever going to find my man? Come on, ladies. Don't worry. He says, for the pagans run after these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and 
his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34, he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. A great philosopher once said, don't worry. Be happy. Another great philosopher once said, don't worry or worry, but know that worrying is as beneficial as trying to solve an algebra equation by chewing bubble gum. That person said that most things that are really going to matter in life are things that are going to blindside you on a Tuesday afternoon, things that you never even thought to worry about. Don't worry. Listen, if you're hearing this message today, whether you're here in person, you're on the live stream, or maybe somebody shared this with you, and this is three or four months down the road. If you're hearing this and the, and the worries of life are choking you out, if they're distracting you from God, if they're damaging your relationship with him, if they're affecting your spiritual growth, I want to encourage you, stop worrying. Turn it over to God. Jesus says that there's another thing that can choke us out, and it's life's riches and pleasures. Can you imagine being choked out by riches and pleasures? I mean, what a way to go. The only thing I can picture there is, did you guys ever watch DuckTales and there was, this, there was this character, Scrooge McDuck, and he would swim around in his safe full of coins? you ever see that? You imagine him drowning in, a, in, in those coins. That's being choked out by riches and pleasures. I heard someone say one time that they didn't know how much money you have, but they know exactly how much you need, just a little bit more. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I don't know how much you have today, but I know how much you need, and it's just a little bit more. Listen to me. If there's one thing that probably keeps more people out of heaven than anything else, it is greed. It's the love of money. Jesus in Matthew 19 is approached by a rich man. This rich man comes to Jesus, and he says, how can I get into heaven? Jesus tells him, well, follow the commandments. And he lists some of them off, follow the commandments. And the guy says, I do all those things, but what am I lacking? See, he knew that there was something missing in his life. He knew that something wasn't right. And Jesus said, okay, I'll tell you what. If you want to be perfect, if you want to get into heaven, go sell everything you own, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And then he says, if you do, you will have treasures in heaven. The story tells us that the man went away sad because he had many things. What a reason to be sad, having many things. He went away sad because he had many things and he wasn't willing to give them up. When this happened, Jesus turned to his disciples and here's what he said. Truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, guys, let me tell you, there's a perfect example. It's real difficult for someone who's rich to get into heaven. And they're like, yeah, Jesus, we understand. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. It's easier for that camel to jump through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. And he's not talking about money. He's talking about the love of money. He addresses this in Matthew 6, 24 as well. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Then he says, you cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve both. Because if you do, that love of money, the the riches and the pleasures will choke out the seed of God that's growing inside you. And I want to tell you something, too. Some of you all are sitting here today, and you're like, man, I'm glad I'm not rich. That's not me. There's a whole lot of poor people who love money, too. Don't let this be you. Jesus wraps up his explanation of this parable in Luke 8, 15. He talks about the fourth type of soil. He says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, 
and by persevering, produce a crop. The last type of person that Jesus talks about is a person who has good soil. This is the person that we should all strive to be, someone who has good, noble hearts. But if this is you today, you're not off the hook because Jesus says that these people will produce a crop, a a windfall really. He says they'll produce a crop a hundred times, the seed that's in them. In other words, the the the. The word of God is going to take root in their heart and it's going to grow and grow and grow and then it's going to spread to a hundred other people. But it does that through a specific action on their part. Jesus says that they will produce a crop by persevering. Somebody say persevere. How does one persevere in the faith? Hebrews chapter 10 gives us a good start on this. Verses 23 through 25 say this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. There are four keys here to persevering in the faith. The first one is this. Hold unswervingly to the hope that we have. Hold on to that hope that you have, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, and that as long as you serve him, that someday you're going to see him, and that you will never die, and that someday he's coming back for his church. Hold unswervingly to that hope. Don't ever let go. Hold on tight. And I don't mean like Rose in Titanic. You guys remember that movie? Anybody ever see that movie from the 90s? She said, I'll never let go, Jack. I'll never let go. And then that lifeboat came around and she jerked her his hand off her so fast. Come get me. Come save me. I'm right here. Don't hold on to your faith like that. Hold on like a pit bull and never let go. The second way that you persevere is to consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Encourage those around you to do what they're supposed to do. Spur one another on. You know what? We've talked about this before. You know what a spur is? It's a sharp piece of metal and it hurts. Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. When you see those in the church who are not being loving and who are not doing good deeds, you get on to them. You say, listen, you got to get right. You got to do what you're supposed to do. When we do that and we all do it for one another, when we hold one another accountable, it helps us to persevere in the faith. The third thing that the writer tells us is do not give up meeting together as some are most definitely in the habit of doing. Man, I got to tell you guys, all across the country, church numbers are down. We see it here, but but what you don't see is the pastor's groups that I'm a part of on Facebook, and the, and you don't get to have the conversations I have. I was having a conversation with a pastor friend of mine the other day, and he said, Brian, I tell you what, He said, I'm so discouraged, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, man, my people are able to go to school. They're able to go to work. They're able to go to the restaurant. They're able to go to the mall. They're able to go to Walmart. They're able to go on vacation. He said, the only place that it seems they're not able to go is the church where we wear masks and we sit six feet apart. That's where they draw the line. I said, man, I get it. You know, I wanted to encourage him, but I'm like, I get it. I understand. That's how people are. What has happened is people have gotten in the habit of not going to church, doing the exact opposite of what the writer of Hebrews said when he said, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. We persevere by by staying in church, staying in fellowship, staying connected to one another. And then finally, he says, encouraging one another all the more. Encouraging one another. 
We're here to help one another. We're here to lift one another up. We're here to, to give someone a hug when they lose a loved one or to, or to pray for someone when they're sick or they're scared. Encourage one another. Sometimes life's going to be difficult. And as a Christian, I, I'll be honest with you, I think in, in the social climate that we have right now, it's about to get a whole lot worse for Christians. I think the next several years are going to be critical. We've got to encourage one another so that we can persevere in the faith. I love Paul's final letter to Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy, Paul knows he's getting ready to die. He knows his life is almost over. And here's the last thing he says to Timothy, one of the last things in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And my departure, the time for my departure is near. And then he says in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Guys, I want to be able to say that someday. I want to be able to say, look, I know that my time here is almost over, but I can promise you this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race, and I have kept the faith. It hasn't wilted. It hasn't been stolen by the enemy. It hasn't been choked out. I've kept the faith. And now, I'm going on to my just reward. I'm going on to see Jesus, and I'm going to get a crown. And then I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to take that crown, and I'm going to lay it at his feet. And then I'm going to get to spend the whole rest of eternity worshiping my God. According to Jesus, there are four types of soil or people. Today I am bound to ask you, which one are you? I'm going to ask everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes. Some of you didn't have the opportunity to hear last week's message. So some of this is going to be new to you, and I understand that. But today I'm going to ask you to respond by the lifting of hands. There are four types of soil. The first type is the type that is hardened or closed off to the Word of God. Maybe you've been physically or emotionally abused. Maybe someone in the church said something to you one time and you got mad and you're not only mad at the church, but you're mad at God. But your heart and your mind are closed off and you're not going to accept the word and it doesn't matter what anyone says, but maybe, just maybe today, there's a little bit of a crack there in that hardened heart. And you say, you know what, I want, I want God to help me. I want him to soften my heart. I want to give him a chance. If that's you today and you're here and, and you say, my heart has been hardened, but I want to give Jesus a chance, then right where you're at, lift up your hand. Second type of people that's talked about in the Bible. Jesus says is the seed that falls in rocky soil. These are people who have been introduced to the Lord. They love them. They're excited about them. But nobody has taken the time to show them how to live this Christian life. And you feel a little bit lost. You're not sure where to go from here. If that's you, you say, I just need to be discipled, Pastor. I need someone to show me what to do. If that's you, lift up your hand right where you're at. The third type of soil is this. The seed has fallen among thorns. You've accepted the word. You love the Lord and you want to follow him. 
But if you're really honest with yourself, you've got other things that are growing inside you along with the Word of God. Things that are damaging to you, things that are not healthy. Things like greed, the pursuit of success or money. Things like lust. You've got a secret sin that nobody knows about. You're scared to death that somebody's going to find out. Maybe it's just pride. Maybe you you feel like that you don't even need God. You've got this. You're in control. You've got something other than the Word of God that's growing in your heart. And if you're not, if you don't let God get in there and tear it out, then what it's going to do, it's going to choke out your faith. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand right where you're at. Who else? Who else? Hands all over the room. Who else? Thank you. You can put your hands down. The last type of soil, Jesus says, is good soil. People with good, noble hearts who the word is inside you and it's growing and it's flourishing and it's producing a crop. But maybe you're here today and you're like, I feel like that's me. But I don't see it producing a crop. Maybe you're just struggling to persevere. You love the Lord and you want to do right, but you feel so tired. You say, I need him to help me persevere so that I can produce a crop. If that's you, lift up your hand. Who else? Lord, you see the hands that have been lifted today. You see the people that are being honest with themselves and they're evaluating their life and they're evaluating their heart and their mind and their relationship with you, God. And, Lord, the truth is we need you to come in and do a work. So many passages talk about you, Lord, being the gardener. Lord, come in today and prune our hearts. Come in and clean out the thorns, clean out the the lust and the pride and the greed and the other things that are unhealthy that are growing inside of us. And Lord, clean it out so that the only thing that is there is your word, is your love growing inside of us. Teach us, Lord, to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And Lord, help us to persevere. Sometimes we feel like we just can't go on. But Lord, I know that with you we can. Because your word tells us that greater is the one who lives inside of us than the one who is in the world. Lord, strengthen us, encourage us, help us to persevere. Lord, those of us who have gotten out of the habit of meeting together, Lord, get us back in where we belong. Those of us who aren't encouraging one another or who need to be encouraged, Lord, let us begin to do that as a church family, as a body. Let us hold one another up, strengthen one another, and Lord, let us hold one another accountable. And let us be open when others do that for us. praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.